Good afternoon. It's very exciting to see a packed room. Um, I really want to thank the Rappaport Center uh, for assisting us in hosting, being able to host this exciting event. My name is Alyssa Steglish. I teach here at the law school in the Immigration Clinic with my colleague Denise uh, uh, Gilman. And we are just thrilled to be able to host here at the law school uh, this wonderful discussion today. Dozens of our students engage in, in work with refugees, and primarily asylum seekers, uh, providing critical access to legal services here in our community for our community's newest arrivals. Um, from the pro bono counseling uh, for the women and families seeking asylum that we do at the T. Don Hutto facility up in Taylor, Texas, uh, to the Carnes Family Detention Center down in Carnes, um, uh, to actually representing asylum seekers in immigration court uh, through the immigration clinic. And of course, many more of you, both law students and other students who might volunteer with Austin's vibrant immigrant and refugee service organization. So this, this talk, while it will take us um, far over to our neighboring continent, um, we do a lot of the work and it's always important to bring that reflection home. The work, of course, is deeply human with individual stories of pain and hardship. But in that endeavor, we do stand together. Um, our country has made the commitment at, under refugee law to apply those international refugee standards. That's the work that we do um, through the, the Refugee Act here in the United States. Um, and it's good always to hear and have the conversation with other countries, other practitioners in that compact to assess how we're doing and hopefully to see how we can do better. So in that vein, I want to introduce uh, our colleague, Professor Barbara Laubenthal, who joins us from UT's Department of Germanic Studies, um, to host that, who has explored herself immigration in Germany and Europe in her scholarship. And she will introduce uh, Professor Klinhart, who we are absolutely privileged to have uh, back here in the law school. So welcome both professors. OK, well, thank you very much, Elisa. Uh, welcome. And it's great to see so many people here at this talk. So um, this talk has been organized by, uh, it's a joint endeavor by the Department of Germanic Studies, the Center of European Studies, and the Rappaport uh, Center was hosting here, us here today in this beautiful room. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Dietrich Trenhardt, who is a professor in political science at the University of Münster, Germany. Um, he is one of the best known, I can really say that, one of the best known uh, immigration scholars in Germany uh, and Europe. He has published extensively um, on integration policies, refugee policies, um, the role of immigration um, or the interaction of immigration and federal states. Um, his work has covered uh, Germany, obviously, uh, or he has covered in his work Germany. Uh, Europe, but also he's done some comparative work on um, Germany, Europe, and the US, so that might be interesting for our uh, discussion too. Um, most recently, um, he has his, his work has focused on asylum policies, and this is the topic um, that this talk today is going to be about. Um, refugee policies in Germany, and I think we are all aware of this, is a very um, interesting and timely and uh, certainly widely debated a topic. Um, Germany's what's called new refugees policies started with a, a kind of dramatic decision by Chancellor Angela Merkel in 2015 um, to let more than one million um, people from Syria uh, into uh, the country, into Germany. Uh, first, there was a large, uh, huge en enthusiasm um, internationally, um, she was called, the chancellor was called the refugee chancellor or even the new leader uh, of the free world. Um, there was a lot of euphoria in Germany too, so Germans actually were very open um, to this new immigration. Um, but after a couple of months, there was quite a backlash actually. And the government became increasingly uh, criticized um, for its liberal asylum policies, also because many things, and I'm sure Dietrich's going to talk about that, didn't really work. The uh, asylum administration couldn't keep up, etc. Um, so there was a backlash, but there were also beyond 
uh, the German uh, uh, case some important repercussions. One is uh, the rise of the new far right in Germany that tried, not only tried, but actually was able to capitalize on this, on, on, on this refugee uh, influx we now have in Germany, and I'm gonna say unfortunately for the first time since the Second World War, uh, uh, that there is a far right party um, in the German national parliament. Um, and uh, this whole um, refugee policy debate also uh, kind of pointed out uh, a structural is issue of the European Union that obviously wasn't really prepared or didn't really have a common approach on how to deal um, with this influx of refugees. So there are many, and I would say Germany's asylum policies are in flux at the moment. Uh, they have repercussions for Europe, they have repercussions for US, of course, um, and we're gonna hear more about that now. And again, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Dietrich, and Dietrich, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we imported the idea of the immigration clinic to Germany now in the last years. That's new for Germany, uh, American innovation that uh, we have taken up. And there's, for instance, an immigration clinic in Gießen. Uh, uh, and they work, I think, in, in the same, same way as uh, you do. And I think it's uh, one of the best ways to prepare students with cases. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's successful, but it's uh, real, real work. The, to begin with legal issues, the European uh, Union seemed to be well prepared legally with their legal system for uh, immigration, for asylum problems before the asylum crisis. Uh, we, all, we all know about the G Geneva Convention of 1951 with the non-refoulement. So the idea is that no state can send a, 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 a refugee back if he has good reasons to flee. And uh, the European Un Union then tried to, uh, uh, to prepare, uh, to, to, to translate this into a fine legal structure. So we have an asylum procedures directive, which uh, uh, describes how the asylum procedure should be done in all the uh, 28 European, un uh, uh, European Union countries. So the idea is to have the procedure uh, everywhere in the same style and with the same uh, uh, legitimacy so uh, that uh, uh, refugees are not forced to go to a nicer country, but the process should be even over the whole European uh, Union. The second is the reception condition uh, directive. So the reception, the reception standards should be equal in the whole uh, European Union. And the third is the qualification directive, uh, who qualifies as a, a refugee and who, who qualifies not. So the legal standards are quite good and there was an endeavor to have the uh, legal standards relatively high, uh, an endeavor uh, by states like Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and others, who feared that if the standards were not equal over the whole European un Union, uh, all these people would go to our nice little country, to our nice little house. So the idea was to distribute the refugees of the whole Euro European Union. So. The idea was that the standards in Bulgaria should be as good as in Sweden, at least in principle. Uh, then the, uh, there was the Dublin, so-called Dublin Agreement. So the, st the, the state where the refugee entered the European un Union would be responsible for the process. And uh, of course, that was a problem for the, uh, for the border countries of the European Union. So more people entered to Italy and to Greece, and it was uh, relatively difficult to enter, for instance, Germany or Holland directly from outside because uh, there is uh, no direct outer border for these uh, countries. The reason was again that uh, the tradition was that uh, people that people came to Italy or to Greece and then 
moved to Switzerland and the authorities in Mil Milan in the 70s would say uh, if a refugee came over to the Milan authorities and moved to the border over to Switzerland, things are good in Switzerland and things were good in Switzerland uh, really or in Germany. Uh, then uh, in the crisis the, the next step was that the EU voted with a majority vote that's not common in the European Uni Union. It's they always try to have unan unan unanimity, a difficult English word. <laughs> uh, but at that time, it was a majority decision, and it was opposed, as you will know, by uh, Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and uh, Hungary, the uh, new um, some four of, of the new member states. So this was the legal situation before the crisis. Uh, but uh, of course, the problem is the, the legal situation was uh, very good <coughs> and very clear. But on the other hand, these uh, uh, countries on the outer, on the, on the outer uh, border of the European Union felt that they would have to the load if the system worked. And so what did they do? They built fences. Uh, they built fences uh, not with the enthusiasm that some of your American uh, Trump or other people have. Uh, in, in Europe, people still have a bad conscience if they build fences, but still they built fences. That's the Greek fence, uh, excuse me for not translating, uh, and that's the Spanish fence, and the Spanish fence has all the qualities of the former East German border. It's a uh, real uh, uh, strong fence and it's difficult to, to come over. Uh, this fence building, you have it here at the outer borders of the uh, European Union, at the Greek border, there's also Bulgarian fence against Turkey, and this fence in Melilla and Ceuta at the uh, Spanish enclaves on Moroccan soil. I should not say this if I were in Spain, that they are on Moroccan soil, but uh, it's cl uh, clear that there are enclaves on Moroccan soil. And later the Hungarian fence, I come to this uh, later. Um, the situation then was before the crisis that uh, asylum was granted if somebody managed to go to, to, managed to, go to a country and the, the CDU uh, President Kauda uh, said it very clearly we must we must accept refugees if they make it to us. But of course that's a dilemma because then the ref refugees have to come over these fences and somehow to manage these, uh, these problems. And the uh, problem, the core problem is that the debate always only begins when the re refugees are here in our country and the debate is not so hot when the refugees are in Jordan or in Turkey or in Libya or in, 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 in Sudan or other countries outside. That's <coughs> the, the dilemma. And of course, this forces the refugees to depend on traffickers. It's all stories that you know from here. Uh, you, you get high costs, you get high risks, you lose a few things that you have and you invest all your energy in coming over the border instead of preparing to integrate, to learn the language or to uh, do other uh, integrative preparations for the new life. Uh, the solution for many refugees then was to go not over the fence but through the water in mortal danger. And the reason why this happened in such uh, large quantities was that the new leftist Greek government uh, uh, ended the uh, practice of pushbacks. In former years, the Greek authorities, the Greek, Greek uh, police had pushed back these people into uh, Turkey and taken away their motors, sometimes, sometimes very brutal. The new leftist Greek government said everybody can come and the prime minister of Greek even said economic migration is as legitimate as political migration, so everybody could come but he did not, did not prepare anything. So all these people came to Greece and then they were in Greece, but the situation in Greece was quite difficult. And so 
the next thing, as you remember from 2015, was to move to Macedonia, then to Serbia, and first to Hungary, that's now the route after the Hungarian fence, and then on to Austria, Germany, and with particular to Sweden. Um, the Macedonian authorities first tried to uh, deny access to the refugees, but they were not successful. There were so many refugees, and then they felt that they had to give in, and so the route was open, and uh, of course uh, it went against all the principles of which I so have some these nice principles of first asylum in Greece, but that was the situation. And uh, the uh, German government then was confronted with situation, with the situation, and this created conflicts in the European Uni Union. First, a North-South conflict between the coming, uh, the incoming countries like Italy and Greece and Bulgaria, not Spain. The Spanish border is quite successful. The Spanish border regime is quite successful, and there are uh, almost no refugees in Spain. Uh, Spain was then prepared to take refugees that came over Greece or Italy. Uh, there was non-compliance with uh, EU policy standards, uh, especially in the four countries I was uh, speaking of, Poland and the other new member countries, they were absolutely against taking anybody. Uh, non-compliance also with the standards. Uh, in, for instance, in Greece, not so much of bad will, but of, uh, say, ineffectiveness, mm -hmm. to say it uh, mildly, to, uh, uh, so the, the, the refugees were there, but there was no food, no organization, only private uh, people who helped. And then there was, uh, so there was a North-South conflict, an East-West conflict, and the redistribution uh, was not successful. Uh, some countries were openly opposed, but I must also say some other countries did not really take refugees. At the height of the crisis, when uh, the public mood was, as you said, very much in favor of the refugees, not only in Germany, but I th would say uh, Europe-wide or worldwide, uh, the British government, for instance, proposed that they would take 20,000 refugees over five years. That would be 4,000 refugees uh, uh, a, uh, a year. And uh, that was about uh, a fifth of the, p the people coming every day to Munich. Mm -hmm. So uh, also the Western, uh, some of the uh, old democracies in Western Europe were not eager to take in so many refugees. Then, of course, there was this question of three million uh, refugees in Turkey and of the broken down government in Libya, this uh, awful situation of the warlords in Libya in these uh, terrible camps and the unstable situation in the Middle East and Africa where many, many refugees are still waiting to get a better life somehow, somewhere. Uh, as you can see, the situation with uh, positive asylum decisions is very uneven. So for in 2016, and the same is, for, is true for 2017, Germany alone took more, uh, more than half of the positive asylum decisions. And if you go to into the second line, per million inhabitants, you see that Sweden is still the country taking uh, per capita uh, most of the most refugees. And on the third line, you can see how different the decision making in the European Union is. So we have these nice standards I was talking of, uh, but you know law is one thing and reality is sometimes uh, different thing. So we have uh, the highest uh, uh, recognition rate in Austria and the Netherlands. Uh, almost the same in uh, Germany and Sweden. Of course, that can be quite okay. That's not so different. But then you have a very, very low uh, rate uh, in Poland and uh, also a quite a low rate in France and in Great Britain. 
and uh, of course that's a difference uh, you cannot explain uh, by the quality of the refugees, by the incoming refugees, but that's uh, a governmental decision making. We also have some problems in Germany between uh, the various regions, but uh, these uh, differences are immense. To have it at, at, a, at, a, at a chart, uh, you see uh, the same uh, tendencies here that in absolute numbers, and <laughs> you cannot uh, put the German figure in the same context as mm -hmm. the other figures. The uh, situation is still about the same. The only, was, uh, the only thing uh, what has changed, and you can see it here in the second line with Italy, the Italian authorities are now much more successful uh, in uh, their asylum processes, uh, and they are taking, they are now the second, uh, the second country taking in asylum seekers. This has really changed. They are much more effective than they used to be, so the negative image with which uh, Italy uh, always uh, had in asylum uh, policies is no longer justified. So, for instance, they take uh, man many more uh, asylum seekers than, for instance, France and especially Great Britain, who uh, is opting out of the whole problem Europe-wide. Now to the German situation uh, and to the Chancellor, which you already mentioned. Uh, the Chancellor, uh, some weeks before the Great Decision, had a, 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 a um, televised meeting with some school children, some of these, uh, these nice televised meetings which make politicians uh, human. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, there suddenly there was uh, this Palestinian girl who said, why do I not have the same chances as all my classmates? I speak German well, I am eager to learn, but I'm, it's totally unclear what will happen. And so the Chancellor said, we are not able to get all the people in, and politics are hard sometimes, so maybe we will be sent back that's a legal situation. And uh, some people, you know, in the, in the television age, you can make YouTubes. Uh, somebody did a YouTube about the situation and uh, Angela Merkel was uh, heavily criticized for she, she caressed the child, for caressing the child, but telling this relatively brutal situation. Uh, and so it was quite a surprise that uh, only a few weeks later, she was the person of the year and she said this, this famous word, wir schaffen das, we make it, we can do it, and we can get these people in. Uh, so uh, a change in, in a few weeks, and the media, of course, not only in Germany, as you said, but worldwide took it up, and it was controversial all over the world, as you know, Ab Obama was very positive about it, but his, his successor was very negative about it. Mm -hmm. So even America had made uh, headlines. Uh, so the press concentrated very much on Angela Merkel, and the press has this, this I would say, not should not say the natural inclination, but the inclination to personalize things uh, and to create to. Uh, to tell the story that the, the uh, important chancellor changed uh, the world, did something, and she is the positive, or in the Hungarian case, with the Hungarian prime minister, the negative figure. And of course, this was also an uh, important element that the Hungarian uh, prime minister, Orban, took pride in being the bad guy he got very popular to by being the bad guy, and this played up against each other, and so Angela Merkel was in contrast, especially to such people like Orban, uh, the good lady. Uh, and this went around the world, and uh, of course uh, she became kind of, an, a positive, uh, of an icon. If you look into the numbers, the refugee numbers, you see that before the decision, decision in uh, 
5th of September 2015, the refugees were already there. Some of them were not, uh, not in, in Germany, but they were in Hungary or in Serbia on the, on the trail, on the migration trail, you could say. And the only thing she could decide was to close the German borders and have lots and lots of human tragedies at the border. There was this incident just before the decision where in a lorry, smugglers put people in a lorry and they died. And of course, that may make headlines. And uh, so th her decision was between a friendly, uh, a, a f a friendly uh, and hospital, hospitable uh, taking in of the refugees, or an unfriendly. They would have come anyway, maybe not all, but they could not stay in Hungary, which where the government created a very unfriendly atmosphere and denied them access. To even to uh, the, 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 the most necessary things. And uh, uh, so Merkel's decision was in this situation unavoidable, but uh, the ability of politicians, of course, is then to create a positive image. And this was the point where Merkel was as never as popular as, uh, was more popular as ever before in Germany and over the uh, European Union. Uh, one nice uh, story is that the Scottish government, which was very unhappy with the decision of the British government, sent uh, some 200,000 pounds to Munich to help. So this is very typical for the atmosphere early in early September 2015 that people wanted to engage uh, and to help but uh, and now they had found a politician who was positive and had this uh, done this positive decision. She had uh, decided the opening together with the Austrian chancellor, but he never got as popular because he was not the decisive figure and he was in a much more difficult situation in Austria. Uh, Merkel got overwhelming support from civil, so civil society, but I should, uh, I should uh, uh, rather say uh, the support from civil society was there before the decision. So the climate was very, very positive. The media were very, very positive. And uh, you can say that this, this support from civil society is still there even in 2018. Uh, not so open over society, not so much in the media, but the people helping are still there. And it was overwhelming that the support went through the whole society. So you had uh, older ladies who remembered their own fate after 1945. I've many heard many stories and know many people personally who said we came uh, to Western Germany and it was uh, very, very difficult we were seen as gypsies, as uh, dirty, as since we had nothing, came with nothing. And uh, now we want to help these people who are in the same situation. So we had all through the whole society, uh, students uh, were very active in creating apps. Uh, everybody did what he could. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the local governments were very successful. Most local governments, I think almost all local governments with the exception of our capital, Berlin, where we had some inefficiency uh, notoriously, uh, they were very successful in hosting these incoming people. It's about 1.5% uh, of the population. So if you translate it to Austin, you would have 15,000 people suddenly coming in and you have to find accommodation for them. Uh, some pictures very very typical uh, for the for the situation in uh, 2015 and uh, very interesting also the ability to organize spontaneously. So this is a map of Munich and you see where you can go and where the volunteers can go to find somebody uh, to find a, a place where they can become active. So this spontaneous activity 
was uh, very impressive. Germans are always thought to be effective, but not so spontaneously uh, effective. And <laughs> Merkel at that time said we must uh, be a bit more spontaneous. We, uh, uh, the routine must be overcome uh, uh, somehow. And that's really the case in uh, my university, for instance. Uh, we had some problems with the integration of foreign students, but with this wave of new incoming people, some of these problems were suddenly not there, but because uh, uh, you could not, uh, in this situation, uh, people were more open to solve problems uh, than in a uh, normal situation. Uh, uh, one colleague has called this uh, explosion of solidarity, and you see that uh, lots and lots of people did something in the first weeks, of course, donation of clothes and other things. That's not so important now. Uh, and uh, you see how, how far, how, how high the percentages are. Uh, and uh, it's uh, gone, uh, this, uh, uh, this lady did the survey in May 16 and in April 17, and you see that it's gone, even gone up a bit. So this talk in the media that the climate has changed is true for the media climate, but not for the, uh, for the volunteers uh, on the ground. It's still there and people are still working, uh, even when they sometimes, especially in Eastern Germany, find not such a nice atmosphere in the public. Uh, then there is was a question, do we have uh, positive or negative experience in experiences in contact with the refugees? And you see that it's going up. There are more contacts that's natural if people of refugees are longer in the country. But uh, this story in the media that uh, the climate has changed and people are uh, negative is not true on the ground. So you have the political situation, you have the media situation, and uh, you have the situation with the volunteers, and uh, the, uh, the it's not identical, but uh, the, the, the mechanisms, uh, mechanisms are diff rather different in all these respects. Uh, there were uh, 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 the local governments uh, uh, had to take care of these uh, uh, lots of people, <coughs> and so the situation was that a mayor would have been told, tomorrow we send you 80 people, or tomorrow if it's, it's a larger, a larger, city, larger town, we send you 800 people or whatever. And they had suddenly to, to manage uh, this. Uh, I remember uh, uh, talking to one uh, state official who did this. He had one mayor who didn't, <laughs> who first was not prepared to with this unexpected situation to handle it. And he told him, we, we put them on, on the railway station and then you have, him, have them. So <laughs> uh, this worked quite well and uh, uh, largely efficient. Uh, what was not so efficient was the federal government. Uh, I come back to this uh, uh, province uh, later. There were uh, special occasions. Uh, so for instance, in Trier, in a wine city, they have the wine queen every year, and it's always a local lady. They had one exception, they had, uh, before, had uh, one, excep had one exception before, that was a lady from Düsseldorf, uh, 150 kilometers away, that was not local. So they took this Syrian wine queen to say, she belongs to us, they belong to us, and they crowned her with this <laughs> nice, in this nice ceremony. So you had uh, all these uh, endeavors to make it very positive and to welcome the refugees, but on the other hand, you had also a fierce opposition, and this was the other side of the story that uh, in uh, February 19, 2016, for instance, a planned asylum home in Bautzen in Saxony uh, was burned 
and it was clearly burned so as to make the, the it impossible to, to get the refugees to Bautzen. So you had a, this majority population, you had a very <coughs> positive attitude, but the situation got tense and uh, uh, the division in the country was uh, growing uh, then. Um, the we had problems at the federal level. Uh, the idea to create a federal office for migration af and refugees in 2005 was that a central office would be very efficient. Uh, all the responsibilities would be concentrated, all the uh, abilities would be concentrated, but our experience was that the central office was the problem office. So the local government uh, dealt quite well with the refugees, the state governments also, but we had a, a problem with the recognitions at the federal level, and you can see it here the backlog. This is red figures. They were not able to uh, recognize the refugees, and they had a long backlog with uh, asylum decisions, <coughs> and of course it hampered the process of integration very much because all these people were there. They got fed, they got closed, they got uh, the, the children uh, got into schools or into kindergartens, but they didn't know what their the decision about them uh, would be, and so this was the backlog in the asylum admi uh, administration. Mm. The Ministry of the Interior was responsible for the situation. Uh, the Ministry is a, of the Interior is a security ministry, and they always had this tradition of uh, being uh, rather uh, negative about uh, so many people coming in. So the uh, integration logic was not very developed, uh, and they traditionally had a rather a deterrence logic, and it was difficult for the ministry to overcome this. The minister was not very strong. We had for former ministers who were very strong and were able to overcome this work, this, this, uh, these traditional tendencies. So Merkel was the uh, welcome chancellor, but under her, in her government, that was uh, 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 things didn't work well, and so she established a coordination office at the chancellery. But of course, the for the day-to-day -day routine decisions, the uh, this was still the, the responsibility of the Ministry of the Interior, and this was uh, a problem, which uh, of course frustrated the refugees and also the volunteers. So you had a volunteer who tried, uh, I remember to in 2015 at a conference an old, old lady uh, uh, said uh, she had found a job for as an asylum seeker, but when the entrepreneur knew that the decision was not taken, it could take two years to get a decision of this person could stay, he wouldn't take him. And of, of course, so the integration was hampered by these these problems. The political parties, all political parties, uh, backed Merkel's policy, and this was the situation where leftists suddenly felt that they should vote for Merkel because she was this uh, had this positive image and she was a hero of welcome. Uh, and so the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Left Party were uh, for her policies. The opposition came only from the uh, Bavarian sister parties. We speak of the sister parties. Sometimes it's a bit ironic to speak of the Christian sister parties, CDU and CSU, uh, because uh, they are, as you know, sisters have some conflicts sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and uh, so the opposition came only from uh, Bavaria. Uh, and it was in the heart of government because the CSU, the Bavarian sister party, also had ministers in uh, the cabinet. The CSU uh, went so far as to invite the Hungarian prime minister who treated uh, the refugees so 
or badly, badly. And so this, the, this conflict was uh, in 2016, early 2017, in the news. And uh, the iconic thing is uh, the <laughs> Germans here will remember the situation where CSU leader Seehofer, the man on the left, uh, lectured Merkel for 15 minutes at, a, at the party conference and she stood there like a schoolgirl and didn't uh, rep reply but she, she stood fast and this conflict then went on. The media were united for refugees in 2015 and uh, since early January 2016 this, this affair, this sexual harassment in Cologne around in, in New Year's Eve. There is a talk of the change of climate again and again. This is repeated uh, and the media uh, are longing for this, this uh, uh, change of climate, but still the media situation compared to other countries like uh, Austria or, or Denmark is relatively uh, positive and uh, many newspapers still go into personal stories of refugees to uh, make clear how difficult the situation is if you leave your country uh, for uh, new countries. The TV talk shows, shows were a bit more problematic. These talk shows, their, their logic is to have confrontation on the table. And so, so since they couldn't find uh, radical critics of Merkel in the early days, they invited people from Switzerland where there is a tradition of uh, a, a longer tradition of xenophobia, of open xenophobia, uh, and made them <coughs> visible at one point. The Swiss parliament uh, had bad feelings about the image of Switzerland in, in Germany because that happened so often, but later they found German uh, critics. So uh, <coughs> the situation with the media was rather open, rather positive. But then there was this discussion about Lügenpresse, lying press. So s some people had the idea that the press, the media were too positive. And there was this talk about uh, media crisis and in, in, the, in, the, social, in the social media, uh, very, very negative. The problem uh, now is that uh, people are fed. They uh, have housing, better or worse, but they have housing, uh, uh, they have clothing, they go to children go to school and so on. But the big problem is uh, employment. The German economy is very specialized, and uh, uh, our tradition is that in every job, even if you paint a wall, you have to have a license and a degree. So the wall is painted very well but uh, this makes integration quite difficult. And uh, compared to countries like United States uh, or Great Britain, we also uh, have, uh, have a, a rather regulated labor market. The positive side is that you have uh, not much uh, of an informal sector. The negative side is that integration is difficult. That's a problem for the next years. The discussion today is about language courses, better language courses, language learning. Um, there is some repatri repatriation, but only successful only for the countries of the, for people from the Balkan countries. Few youth come to Germany. Some used to come to uh, over the winter because they had, had no heating in, in Serbia. These people uh, were sent back or went back after some some discussion. Uh, there is still the conflict between the integration logic and the deterrence logic, the deportation logic of the Ministry of the Interior. There are fears. The uh, fears of uh, is Islam, fears of crime. Islam has a bad image uh, or, or in Germany as in other countries. Uh, there are fears of terrorism. We, we, had, we had terrorist attacks, uh, terrorist attacks, and uh, the loss of control in 2015, of course, was also connected to some of these attacks. Uh, one uh, uh, attacker in the attacker in Berlin came from uh, Italy, 
and the Italian authorities had information but didn't transfer it. And to make it fair, uh, the Paris attackers came through Germany and the German authorities didn't keep, uh, didn't uh, know about them. Uh, the majority is still positive. We have a, a racist minority who has a voice, who is, can be heard. We have this new party in Parliament, which you spoke of, the alternative, uh, alternative for Germany. Merkel always used to speak that uh, there is no alternative to her policies, and this was the answer, alternative for Germany. We had losses for the coalition parties, and uh, this 14% for this alternative for Germany. Now the situation is rather calm. We have about 200 more refugees per year. In former years, that would have been, uh, people would have seen, uh, said that the high number. We compare this to this 20,000 of Cameron I was speaking of for Great Britain, but now 200,000 uh, are uh, uh, said to be manageable. We have discussion about family mi migration, so should the Syrian refugees who are here in Germany, should they have the right for family migration? That's under discussion in Parliament. We have a very high spending it's around the size of the defense budget for refugees if you com put together the federal, the state, and the local government spending. And uh, there are also protests against deportations if they uh, are there, for instance, here in Bavaria with uh, students. So the mood of the people is still positive. The volunteers are still volunteers and still working and helping. But the atmosphere in Germany is much more controversial than, the, than it used to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dietrich, for this really interesting talk. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions or comments from you. So if you have any questions for Dietrich or comments. So I want first to elaborate, perhaps incorrectly, on one of the things you said and then ask a question about it. My understanding is that in Germany there are admirable apprenticeship training programs for most occupations, not just for being a plumber or an electrician, yeah. but other kind of building jobs, for being a cake baker, for being a bread baker, for being a salesperson in a bakery. All these things mm. involve apprenticeship programs. It may be that a considerable number of refugees actually have the skills to perform these programs haven't gone through these programs. Mm. Is there any, one these jobs, but haven't gone through these programs. Is there any political discussion going on on relaxing these requirements of having gone through these kinds of training programs to allow refugees yeah. who have relevant skills to yeah. get these jobs? There is a system to evaluate these, to, to see if, if, for instance, the hairdresser can, can do these things, and then to give him a, 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 a paper to say he can do these things and to integrate him or to uh, uh, to give him tr uh, uh, more trainings so that he can, can get to a higher level. So uh, the, these uh, crafts, uh, 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 these, they are very interested. So the big industry like Mercedes, the big companies are not so interested, economically not so interested in refugees, but the smaller companies are very, very interested. And uh, if you have a combination of economic self-interest and humanitarian approach, that can be a very, very successful. So we, you have a lot of positive stories, but of course the, the, the amount of the problem is still there, and of course it's also a language problem. Um, under the new coalition government, uh, which political party has the ministry that handles refugees? And although it's not directly related to your topic, uh, why did Chancellor Merkel find it necessary to give up both the foreign ministry and the finance ministry to the Social Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> that seems that was a a hard discussion, and I, I, uh, I, I'm really, uh, everybody is astonished about it, uh, as you are. It's not only, it's the Ministry of, of the 
the foreign ministry, the finance ministry, and also the ministry for labor and social affairs, which is also very, which has the largest household. Um, so it was a, discu a hard discussion, and uh, reports say that uh, for some time they, they did not even talk to each other in the night because the situation was so tense. But uh, Merkel gave, in the end, she gave in because she, I think she wanted to stay as chancellor. And her experience is, up to now, that she has always been uh, successful as chancellor electorally, and the coalition partners have always lost out, even if they had good ministers and if they were successful with their policies. Uh, the chancellor is, uh, as here in the, in the is, is a big person, and people uh, uh, like to put their uh, think that the chancellor is a decisive actor always. And, is, and the, the Minister of the Interior goes to the CSU, to the CSU president, and that, that will be an interesting, interesting uh, situation because then if he has the ministry himself, it's difficult to make opposition against himself. But uh, the CSU is always, has always been very successful to sit in the government and to, do, uh, to make opposition against the government. So this, this double bind situation. Uh, so the, the great CSU leader once said, uh, the principle is uh, practical politic in the politics in the morning, propaganda in the evening. And so my prognosis is that the discussion will be between the, the Minister of Inter Interior and the Bavarian state government in the future. I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Is that working well? Yeah, Do that's all the uh, I, I, I have no complete oversight, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it seems that uh, the, the learning German uh, works quite quite well. And uh, it's especially, it it's works better than with, with the adults. Uh, and there is much uh, enthusiasm. Uh, in schools and kindergartens in this, this respect. And uh, I was a bit critical about Bavaria, but for instance, the, the Ministry of for, for Education in Bavaria is uh, very pushing. Uh, so the situation again in, in Bavaria is that the government in open is very negative about taking in refugees, but they try to be very, very successful and very innovative hardworking in integrating these people who are there because they know that uh, the economic, uh, that otherwise we th they would have economic problems and social problems if the integration wouldn't, wouldn't work and that the industry needs these people. There are conflicts, as I showed in this last picture, uh, sometimes if uh, somebody has found work but the Ministry of the Interior then says uh, we would like to deport him. So these are now the, the conflict. Sabine Haag and then you. Sabine Haag. Uh, I want to uh, challenge you on the point that it is only a racist minority that holds anti-immigrant views. I think that uh, uh, if I want to be polemical, I would say it's precisely such arguments that um, contribute to the rise of the alternative for Germany. I think we need to take seriously um, the arguments of, of people against uh, specifically an overwhelmingly young um, single male Muslim immigration to kind of give an illustration of my point that uh, precisely around issues of gender roles and women uh, where the resistance um, and the doubts and uh, the concerns about immigration have formed new alliances and that was um, caused by the New Year's Eve event in Cologne and more recently the rape and murder of a 
question of female titles, where it is women, feminists, uh, liberal, we'll call them white, the moms in the US, uh, say there has to be a debate about this. And I think politicians are incredibly blind to the incredible force with, with that whole global Me Too movement that also it, uh, is a Lyme disease debate to completely ignore them all as racist uh, in the equal language. There is a debate about it. I know, but you yeah. said that uh, the racists are the minority. And I think it is a bit more complicated. And I think one needs to take seriously their argument. Yeah, the debate is, of course, uh, the, the feminist debate about Muslims uh, was there in Germany before the events. Uh, so for instance, Ali Schwarze, the, the famous uh, and successful feminist uh, um, magazine publisher uh, uh, focused on these, these issues, I think, at, since at least 10 years. Uh, and uh, of course, there is an issue, but I'm quite skeptical about the idea that in our Western world, uh, women were equal since uh, decades. And the problem is only with these uh, Muslim men. There is a problem with Muslim men. But as you say, as the Me, Me Too debate shows, there are other gender problems too. So uh, there are education problems, uh, education programs now. And uh, in the integration course, there are elements about uh, gender equality and uh, it's not about, uh, not about uh, only about language learning, but about edu uh, political education, gender education, and so on. Uh, there is a problem, of course. And uh, uh, you often have the situation that uh, you have older women, as I said, caring for young men, and there, there are some misunderstandings there are also misunderstandings between uh, feminist uh, women and incoming Muslim women because they cannot grasp the feminist approach that is brought to them. We have the, the uh, whale issue, the, the headscarf, not whale, the headscarf issue because now most of these uh, Muslim women wear headscarves, not all but a majority because they are used to head the headscarf. We have a headscarf discussion since long in Germany. Can a teacher wear, wear a headscarf? I think we are less liberal in this respect than the Americans, more, more liberal than the French. But uh, there's a discussion about uh, is a headscarf uh, a symbol of, of subjugation, uh, su subjugation of women or is it a right that some women have? Uh, so these questions are there, and they will be dis dis discussed, I think, at least in the next 20 years. So if I may add really quick, I would say that the problem in Germany at the moment is more about Islamophobia. So there is a, 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 there is a rise of Islamophobia in Germany, but if you look at the actual figure, figures regarding xenophobic sentiments, they, they, they've been staying uh, uh, at the same level for the last 15 years. So, and what is what is interesting, I would say, about the German case is that um, despite this huge influx and all the problems that we've been just talking about, um, if you look at, at, at the numbers, if you look at the polls, at the surveys, you see that the majority of German children turn up in favor of immigration, prepared to help. So there are contradictory tendencies here, but I would say personally, Islamophobia is the biggest is the biggest issue the biggest mm -hmm. issue here at the moment in Germany. Mm -hmm. But now it's your turn. Yes. It's Germany.
There is a tradition was always that the United States took European refugees in the Cold War. The refugees would come to Germany or to Austria, and then the United States would take part uh, of the refugees. Uh, I think that's, that's over, this, this, this tradition largely over. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, there is a problem with, with Western intervention in the Middle East, which is the root cause of many of these of these uh, problems. And so we are happy that the United States are not as interventionist as in the, in the <laughs> decades uh, before. Uh, I, I, I forgot to say, I wanted to say something. I think the, these uh, if, uh, events, for instance, <coughs> in Cologne, uh, are the, the far you are off the events, uh, the more they are symbolic. So the Cologne mayor, I just uh, read an interview with the mayor of Cologne, she's a woman also, uh, and she was hurt, she was stabbed by a right-wing radical, and she said the situation after the, these events in Cologne is stable, and we are going to have carnival as before, we have more police, but we do not change our life. You are absolutely right. <laughs> that is okay. often not Next the case. question, Rocky. Yes. Yeah, just to jump off the language uh, issue and then I'll get to my question. I was in Mannheim for <coughs> six months and I, th I think it is kind of a collaborative effort between private companies and the government. I think SAC did a great job of really driving on a lot of young refugees there between the ages of 18 and 25 and really supported language classes for them. Language, of course, I think is crucial for their integration in Germany. Germany has been able to just find with its language as a result of this. As far as a broader legal perspective within the EU, you were talking about some of the recognition rate differences and so forth, and I know that immigration policy, asylum, refugee policy is under, a, I think, Article 5, a shared competence with the EU. Mm -hmm. How is the Commission looking to adjust this, kind of have similar standards? These directives are implemented by member countries in different, varying ways. They have different definitions of what a safe country is, well-founded fears of persecution, and I think that's what's causing this recognition. Recognition rate differences. I know that Turkey EU deal was hashed out a couple years ago, which has been negative overall. A lot of things were said. So, what do you see from the EU Commission going forward as far as how to remediate this problem that France really faces with some of the detainment that's not just under the kind of the same type of country's economic rules? The <laughs> Commission is very active in sending notes to, I think, to all member countries, some more, some less. And my ironic. Uh, interpretation is that Switzerland is the only country who keeps to the EU <laughs> <laughs> regulations. <laughs> uh, even Germany has some, some faults. So the EU com uh, Commission reminds, uh, and she, uh, you know this uh, difficult process to go s up to the European Court and to, uh, to have fines and so on, but uh, all nearly all member countries are guilty.
servants, if you will, on Islam and the history of the West and cultures? Like, are, is there another side of the coin uh, that there are more Jews in the West that share the same culture? Uh, I think there's not, not so much, not much done. Uh, the, the problem in Germany is that you have a tradition of religious instruction in Germany. Germany is a, the tradition is that Germany is a bi-religious country and historically we had all these conflict between Protestants and, and Catholics. And so one way to, to keep this out was to have Catholic instruction and Protestant instruction. So in my Protestant instruction, I didn't learn much about Catholics. I learned some negative things about the Pope <laughs> and Luther and uh, Luther liberated us from the Pope and so on. And I am sure that my, my friends, my Catholic friends learned the other way around. Uh, this uh, and so uh, there is almost there is not much knowledge about Islam. Uh, our former uh, parliamentary speaker, Susmut, always tells people that uh, the, the, the Quran has in, in, in uh, to a high percentage stories from, from the Bible, uh, but this comes as, as a surprise to, to people. Central Conference of Judaism, the third, the Central Conference of Islam, uh, the fourth, uh, the Catholics, who are not very well respected, the fifth, Islam in general. But on the whole, the disrespect for Islam is very low. The other factor that I'm interested in this context is that despite the fact that West Germany has way more refugees per inhabitant than East Germany, the rejection of uh, refugees is much bigger in East Germany than in West Germany. So partially connection fosters understanding, but I think it's also that the East Germans are very bad about educating their nations of 40 million as we are, where they make in democracy the impending conflict and so on. So in that respect, I find what you said today made the Germans, after so many years after 1945, quite encouraging, because I think to see, especially the local reaction, seems to reflect that the Germans have learned something from the history. Um, I think if, if you go into this difference between East and West Germany, the West German uh, experience is that we had immigration since uh, of foreigners, since uh, working well, foreigners, a lot of in the East, and they were very uh, since since the yeah the since fifty five, and so the experience of many many people is that they have Italians or Turks or whatever at the same workplace and that. In, in the workplace that functions quite well. Whereas the East German experience, we were telling about the Vietnamese, they were hidden away in, in the East German, by the East German regime. And uh, then it came as a surprise to them about uh, upon reunification, they thought they would uh, unite with uh, Germans and suddenly they got all the asylum seekers through the distribution, uh, overall distribution. And so the experience is different. The West German have a long experience with uh, working, with contributing uh, uh, immigrants, whereas the East German experience is uh, very short and uh, only with uh, people who are not really, who have difficulties in integrating into society.
three or four months later, and that German uh, government signed a contract, signed an agreement with the Afghanistan government on deporting and repatriating refugees from Germany to Afghanistan against their will. Can you just clarify what was happening there in Germany? I cannot clarify it. That's again this integration logic against deportation logic. So the Ministry of the Interior uh, is uh, relatively uh, in, uh, engaging with uh, Syrians, with Iraqis, with Iran's, with Iranis, with uh, Eritreans, but they are trying to stop somehow to stop the uh, flow of. Uh, uh, refugees from Afghanistan, and so the idea is to have some uh, people, to send some people back to, to create a symbol. It's, uh, the numbers are very, very low. It's uh, symbolic policies, uh, and they are trying to keep it, despite all what you said. So, so you have the Minister of the Interior going to Afghanistan and wearing a helmet, and uh, all this, sec this security around him. And uh, the next day he says, uh, parts of Afghanistan is sa are safe. You can't, can't send people to Kabul. The situation in Kabul is not so, not so bad. That's uh, uh, ongoing discussion. And people are very critical, many people are very critical about this. In the, under the German system, do the Syrian refugees or, or their German-born children, do they have a path to citizenship? They have a path to citizenship. Uh, you have, uh, if uh, you are born in Germany, you get the citizenship. No. Uh, if you are born from parents who are legitimately there, no. I don't think so. No, I think, uh, you must have I one. Think there must be a value system. Uh, yes. Because normally, normally the not citizenship goes by the parents. Oh, it, it has changed in, in Germany. It, it has I changed in. No, that has changed in 2000. Uh, but I thought there was a, uh, like five-year period, a ten-year period, yeah. educational requirements, all of that. No, no, uh, oh, the, okay. the par one parent must be in Germany legitimately for eight years. So for, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a new incoming refugee, it's not, they would not get the citizenship, but in the long run. Uh, but uh, there is a path to citizenship as for others. Uh, and uh, uh, the experience is that uh, refugees take the German citizenship much more than other, uh, other uh, foreigners. So, uh, for instance, nearly all Iranians in Germany have taken uh, the German citizenship. I you can't. No. No, the Turks are. Uh, not uh, so open to it because they have to give up their own citizenship. So I if you have uh, refugees, they are mostly happy to give up the old citizenship because they don't want contact with the, with the former regime. Cathy, your citizenship uh, law is one of the biggest, has been one of the biggest immigration reforms that took place in the last uh, 15 years. For well, how long do the parents have to live in Germany for the, they have the foreign parents to just have to go like Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. And then the child can, can choose at the age of 16, between 16 and 23, if he wants to follow that Syrian or the German. And that's how now there's even a dual citizenship. And does it apply to a baby when he's 21 now who just came? He has to wait eight years? Only yeah. well, parents would need to be in the country for eight years. But unfortunately, we're running out of time. But maybe we can, we can discuss yeah. this further later. I would like to thank Dietrich Krenhardt for this talk. <laughs>